You're probably familiar with the concepts of oxidation and reduction from your introductory chemistry course. Oxidation is the loss of electrons and reduction is the gain of electrons. We're going to start looking at redox reactions in the context of organic reactions in this course and the first context we're going to use is transformations of alcohols to carbonyls and carbonyls back to alcohols. And these are related by oxidation and reduction transformations. The oxidation of an alcohol produces a carbonyl compound and the reduction of a carbonyl compound produces an alcohol. One thing to notice if you look at the formulas of the alcohol and carbonyl compound is that oxidation corresponds to a loss of the elements of diatomic hydrogen, H2 in quotes, from the alcohol. And I have H2 in quotes because hydrogen gas won't necessarily be given off but the elements of diatomic hydrogen are lost from the alcohol to form the carbonyl compound. In the reverse direction, reduction is the addition of the elements of diatomic hydrogen to a carbonyl compound to produce an alcohol. In this video series, we'll look at reagents that accomplish these transformations and study their mechanisms in detail. And we'll notice some general patterns emerging in the mechanisms. For example, pretty much all oxidation reactions on some level of alcohols involve elimination as a key elementary step. They're eliminating the elements of H2 from the alcohol. In the opposite direction, the reverse elementary step is very commonly observed. Addition, and especially nucleophilic addition, figures into the conversion of carbonyl compounds to alcohols through a reduction process. These reactions are very important in a biochemical context as well. And just to give one example, the reduction of acid aldehyde, which is CH3COH, to form ethanol is a key step in fermentation performed, for example, by yeast. And this step is catalyzed by alcohol dehydrogenase, but makes use of a reducing agent, nature's reducing agent, NADH, as the source of hydride, nucleophilic hydride, that adds to the carbonyl carbon. At the end of this unit, we'll talk a little bit about the biochemical reducing agents and oxidizing agents and how they work. Let's start by clarifying exactly what we mean by oxidation and reduction. In your introductory chemistry course, you probably became familiar with the ideas of oxidation and reduction in the context of inorganic, often metal ions, right? So something like Fe2 plus going to Fe3 plus and an electron is very clearly an oxidation process since the Fe2 plus ion is losing electrons. On the other side of the equation, Br2 gaining two electrons to form two Br minuses is very clearly a reduction of bromine since bromine is going from neutral in the starting material to negatively charged in the products and it's gaining two electrons in the process. In organic chemistry, we have to think about things a little bit differently because formal charge doesn't always tell the whole story. Very often in organic reactions, we go from a neutral starting material to a neutral product and rather than ionic bonding being involved, everything is covalent. In organic chemistry, it's still true that oxidation corresponds to the loss of electrons while reduction corresponds to the gain of electrons. Leo says Ger still applies. However, rather than looking at formal charges or ionic charges, we focus on electronegativity and the polarization of bonds to carbon atoms in identifying the oxidation numbers of carbon atoms. And the oxidation number of carbon can vary depending on the electronegativity of the atoms linked to it. For example, oxidation involves the replacement of CH or CC bonds, these bonds to relatively low electronegativity atoms, H and C, with bonds to atoms that have relatively high electronegativity. And these are heteroatoms, things like nitrogen, oxygen, and the halogens in groups 15 through 17. If we look at this example here, we see that what's going on is the replacement of a carbon-hydrogen bond at this carbon that becomes the carbonyl carbon, with a new bond between carbon and oxygen, specifically the carbon-oxygen pi bond comes in. At the same time, the elements of H2 are eliminated. And this is an oxidation at this carbon that becomes the carbonyl carbon because a CH bond, a bond between this carbon and an atom that's not very electronegative, hydrogen that's pretty electroneutral, we might say, is replaced with a bond to a highly electronegative atom. So what's 
really happened here, if we think about the partial charges, the dipole moment of the bond and things like this, is that electron density has been pulled away from this carbon that becomes the carbonyl carbon. As a consequence, oxidation has occurred. A loss of electrons from this carbon atom has taken place. Now, in saying that the elements of H2 are lost, we don't literally mean that hydrogen gas leaves the substrate in most cases. This typically requires the intervention of some oxidizing agent. And if we abbreviate that as O in brackets, the products we end up with are some combination of H plus and the oxidizing agent linked to H such that the OH molecule has an overall negative charge or at least a charge of one less than the charge on the starting oxidizing agent. If oxidation involves a pulling of electron density away from a carbon atom, then reduction must involve the opposite. And operationally what this means for organic reactions and for carbon is that in a reduction reaction, a bond between carbon and a relatively electronegative heteroatom, one of these atoms in groups 15 through 17, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, bromine, chlorine, is replaced with a bond to hydrogen or carbon, a relatively electroneutral element. For example, if we take a look at the figure given, we see that in this reaction scheme, what has happened is the replacement of the carbon-nitrogen pi bond, which I'm here highlighting in red, for a new single bond to a hydrogen atom. So this is, in a very real sense, the reverse of the oxidation process. A bond to an electronegative heteroatom, the carbon-nitrogen bond in red, is replaced with a carbon-hydrogen single bond. Because hydrogen is far less electronegative than the nitrogen atom, what we've done in replacing this bond to nitrogen with a bond to hydrogen is actually donated electron density back to the carbon. And this represents a gain of electrons for the carbon, a reduction of this carbon atom here. What has happened in a sense is the addition of H2 to this organic molecule. That said, hydrogen gas is not always used as the actual reducing agent in these processes. More commonly, the actual reducing agent is a source of nucleophilic hydrogen, or H-, also called hydride, followed by treatment with acid, which provides H+. And so we see we have the elements of diatomic hydrogen, H- and H+, just coming as two separate atoms rather than together as hydrogen gas. Hydrogen gas can be used to reduce functional groups like amines, CN double bonds, and carbonyl compounds. But more commonly, we'll see this accomplished through the use of H- followed by H+. One last thing to mention before moving forward is that what we're seeing here is the exchange of a sigma bond for a pi bond in the first example, or a pi bond for a sigma bond in the second example. And these amount to elimination in the first case, and the addition of H2, the reverse addition, of H2 to the substrate in the second case. When a sigma bond is replaced with a sigma bond, we go from addition or elimination to a substitution. So the formation or cleavage of CX or CH sigma bonds can also represent an oxidation or reduction. So for example, oxidation might involve the substitution of a CH or CC bond, relatively electroneutral, with a CX bond where X is an electronegative heteroatom, something like nitrogen, oxygen, chlorine, bromine, etc. And as we've seen, what this does is pull electron density away from the carbon atom at which the substitution occurred, since oxygen is more electronegative than hydrogen. And here what's happening, in a more descriptive way to say it, is an electrophilic substitution. What we've done is we've treated with an electrophilic source of oxygen, which here in quotes I've written as OH+, and in the substitution what we've generated, which is not shown, is H+, which ultimately becomes incorporated into a base as the conjugate acid of the base, H base+. Plus. And for these kinds of reactions, we see substitution type mechanisms, things like protonation followed by SN2 or SN1 type mechanisms, these can lead to oxidation through a substitution process. Reduction similarly can involve a substitution process, but now the substitution is in the opposite direction with a bond between carbon and an electronegative heteroatom 
being replaced by a bond to carbon and a relatively electroneutral element like hydrogen or carbon. And these might involve things like nucleophilic acyl substitution. Check out this example. A carbon-chlorine bond, relatively electronegative chlorine here, is replaced with a carbon-hydrogen bond through a mechanism in which the starting material is treated with H- first, nucleophilic addition, beta elimination, followed by H+, and this generates the aldehyde and HCl. This corresponds to a reduction because in replacing the electronegative chlorine atom with an electroneutral hydrogen, we've actually donated electron density back to the carbonyl carbon. This carbonyl carbon is much less electrophilic than it is in the starting acyl chloride. Reductions of this type can also involve relatively straightforward SN2 of a good leaving group with the hydride anion, sometimes coming from something as simple as sodium or potassium hydride. One more important point to mention here is that the replacement of CH sigma bonds for a carbon-carbon pi bond is generally considered oxidation. And the reason for this becomes clear if we follow the fates of the hydrogen atoms as we move down or up this series. In going from an alkane to an alkene, for example, the elements of H2 are lost from the alkane starting material, and this corresponds to an oxidation process. We're losing H2 and replacing it with a carbon-carbon pi bond. Going from an alkene to an alkyne similarly involves the loss of the elements of hydrogen, H2, from the substrate. And so this, too, is an oxidation. Moving in the opposite direction, we are adding or incorporating the elements of H2 into the substrate. So an alkyne to an alkene involves the incorporation of H2. That's reduction. And similarly, the conversion of an alkene into an alkane also involves the incorporation of the elements of H2. And this is also a reduction. And when these reductions are actually performed from alkyne to alkene and alkene to alkane, typically hydrogen gas is actually used along with a metal catalyst because moving in this direction this reduction process is thermodynamically favorable, replacing pi bonds with CH sigma bonds.